Hi, this is Dave and Bruce once more. Today we're looking in the Book of Mormon, 2 Nephi, chapter 31. And Bruce, uh, I know you've taken some time to prepare a, a PowerPoint today to help us better understand this, this ordinance. The Doctrine and Covenants tells us that uh, we as parents need to teach our children to understand um, faith, repentance, baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost. And if that implication is, is that we understand it as parents. And so I thought we'd focus on baptism. We're going to use a lot of scriptures. So again, bear with us. Uh, it's what I've discovered in the past when I've tried to present some of these concepts. It's made a lot of primary presidents upset and even some bishops because of our traditions that we teach and so we're going to go over what the scripture says um, to begin with. When I was doing research, I was given a hierarchy I could use um, in answering questions that I was given. Um, the hierarchy uh, really begins with the, um, with the sources that I'm going to use to answer the questions. The first, first source I could use was uh, the scriptures uh, because they... Uh, are the standards of our doctrine and they do not change those standards do not change the doctrines do not change uh, the second source I could use was the teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith and the third source I could use were the words of the Prophet while they were prophets and I'll explain that to you from the quotes uh, from some of the prophets here uh, Joseph Smith said if any man will prove to me by one passage of holy writ one item I believe to be false I'll renounce and disclaim it Joseph Fielding Smith said, and I'm going to, the, the sources are there, and this is why I was told I could use the scriptures first. I was to use the scriptures first. Um, Joseph and the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith and, the, and then the prophets while they were prophets. Uh, Joseph Fielding Smith said, it makes no difference what is written or what anyone has said. If what has been said is in conflict, what the Lord has revealed, we can set it aside. My words and the teachings of any other member of the church, high or low, if they do not square with the revelations, we need not accept them. Let's have this matter clear. Uh, Harold B. Lee uh, said, if there is any teacher who teaches a doctrine that can't be substantiated from the standard church works, and I make one qualification, and that is unless that one be the president of the church, who alone has the right to declare new doctrine, then you may know by that same token that such a teacher is but expressing his own opinion. Now this is why I could use only the words of a prophet while he was prophet. And he had to agree with the scripture. The scripture is first, um, the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, and then the words of a prophet while he was a prophet. And it had to agree with the scriptures. It had to agree with the other two. And only the prophet and president of the church alone has the right to declare new doctrine. And if that is declared, then it's going to be, it's going to be canonized by declaration. We have two declaration that actually adds to and changes some of, of our scripture, but it's done by declaration, not, not by pulpit, but by declaration. President Lee goes on, I don't care what his position is. If he writes something or speaks something that goes beyond anything you can find in the standard church works, you immediately, you may immediately say, well, that's his own idea. Um, the scriptures are the standards of doctrine, and that does not change. Of all of the concepts we embrace, one of the most important doctrines that members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints should understand is the meaning of our baptism and the partaking of the sacrament and partaking of it worthily. There's more tra traditions that surround baptism and the sacrament, and so we need to understand what the scriptures say about um, the ordinance and the uh, concept of baptism by immersion as well as partaking of the sacrament. A few years ago, and this got me started on this, it was just a few years ago, uh, the counselor in my bishopric stood in testimony meeting and explained how he enjoyed teaching his daughter, who had just turned eight in family home evening that week, that when she was baptized on Saturday, this com that coming up Saturday, how all her sins were going to be washed away. Well, that made me, uh, when, he had, when he said that from the pulpit, I started thinking, why do we do this? Why, why, is, uh, why is that concept taught. I remember that when a child was baptized a number of years ago, the conducting priesthood leader would recognize him or her and have the congregation accept the eight-year-old as, and they would usually say, the cleanest member of the ward. 
Well, that creates, there's a problem, that tells us there's a problem. We even sing in primary a song that when I am baptized, and the second verse begins, uh, that I know when I am baptized, my wrongs are washed away. See, and that's, it went through my mind when the counselor said in testimony meeting how he enjoyed teaching his eight-year-old daughter before she was baptized how her sins were going to be washed away. Something was wrong. Something, something is not con congruent with Scripture. And it makes you question, what's wrong? Why are we teaching this? Why, why are these traditions there? What's going on? And what do the scriptures say about it? Well, we have responsibility as parents, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and in DNC 68, verse 25, it says, And inasmuch as parents have children in Zion or any of her stakes, which are organized, that teach them not to understand the doctrine of repentance, faith in Christ, the Son of the living God, and of baptism, and of the gift of the Holy Ghost, by the laying on of hands when eight years old, the sin being upon the heads of the parents. Well, the statement in there that any parents who have children in Zion that teach them not to understand these concepts, these first principles and ordinances of the gospel, would imply that the parents do understand these things, that they understand the concept of repentance and what it really means and what it really is, as well as faith and baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Christ declares to Joseph Smith in section 29 that little children are redeemed from the foundation of the world through mine only begotten. Wherefore, they cannot sin, for power is not given unto Satan to tempt little children until they begin to become accountable before me. We know this. We know this is a doctrine. Um, Mormon, the prophet in the Book of Mormon, said, uh, condemned the belief that children could sin or that children had sins. And even in this dispensation, that is reinforced again in section 29, that children cannot sin. Yet, we sing in primary that when they are eight years old, their sins can be washed away, which would imply that they had sins before they were baptized. And tradition is often stronger than doctrine. Well, Mormon chapter 8, um, or Moroni chapter 8, verses 8 through 11, uh, Moroni is writing a record of his father, Mor uh, Mormon, and he says, Mormon says, little children are whole, for they are not capable of committing sin. Teach repentance and baptism unto those who are accountable and capable of committing sin. Little children need no repentance, neither baptism. Behold, baptism is unto repentance. Now keep in mind, repentance is the process of changing character. But you can only do that if you know right from wrong. So baptism is unto repentance to the fulfilling of the commandments unto unto the remission of sins. It continues on, For behold, that all little children are alive in Christ. Until that accountability. And then he moves it from children to adults, and also all they that are without the law. <laughs> Those who have no law are not accountable. You can't. You can't be held accountable to gospel law if you do not understand the gospel. And that verse goes on there in uh, verse 8 of um, Romans chapter, uh, chapter 8, uh, verse 22. For behold, the power of redemption cometh upon all them that have no law. That's child as well as adult. Wherefore, he that is not condemned or he that is under no condem condemnation cannot repent, and to such baptism availeth nothing. Well, that brings us to that fourth article of faith where we say, well, but it says we're going to get a uh, uh, the baptism unto or for the remission of sins. As we read there in that fourth article of faith, we believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and second, repentance. Those are principles. Third, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. Fourth, the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so traditions develop around this that we're baptized as a washing, we're baptized as a cleansing, we're baptized to get a remission of our sins, but that's not what the scripture's talking about. So the scriptures will often say, for or unto a remission of sins, which means, it just means, baptiz baptism is required to move forward or unto 
or you're baptized in order to obtain a remission of sins. It doesn't mean that the, bapti the baptism cleanses you, but the baptism is needed in order to obtain a remission of sins. Well, baptism is a sign. And we see this, especially in some of the statements of Joseph Smith. He brings it up at least twice, that baptism is a sign. He says, baptism is a sign to God, to angels, and to heaven that we will do the will of God, and there is no other way beneath the heavens whereby God hath ordained for a man to come to him to be saved and enter into the kingdom of God. And that's, so Joseph is saying it is a sign. There is no other way for a person to come to God except through that baptism. Well, you might question why, and we're going to talk about why that baptism is necessary. In DNC 20, verse 37, we read, And again, by way of commandment to the church concerning the manner of baptism, all those who humble themselves before God, desire to be baptized, and come forth with broken hearts and contrite spirits, and then witness before the church that they have truly repented of all their sins, and are willing to take upon them the name of Jesus Christ, and we could say, which is having a determination to serve him to the end, and truly manifest by their works that they have received with the Spirit of Christ unto the remission of their sins, shall be received by baptism unto his church. Again, repentance, uh, the, and the process of repentance is, is, is the process, is, is changing character. You're trying to change character. You know something that you didn't know before, and you're trying to change not only your mind, but your actions. And that's what it's saying. Those who want to do that, those who are, who are making those change and are willing to take upon them the name of Jesus Christ, which is having a determination to serve him to the end, can be received unto baptism, which makes this connection to what the rest of the scriptures say about it. So the symbol of baptism by immersion we see this throughout the scripture. Joseph Smith teaches, the gospel requires baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, which is the meaning of the word in the original language, namely to bury or to immerse, to go under, uh, to be completely covered over. Um, in in the um, Joseph Smith translation, uh, the Lord's talking to Abraham and and it says, And God talked with him, saying, My people have gone astray from my precepts, and have not kept mine ordinance, ordinances, which I gave unto their fathers. They have not observed mine anointing, and the burial, or baptism, wherewith I commanded them. That's in JST Genesis 17, 4 through 5. In the JST Colossians 2, uh, verses 10 and 12, or 10 through 12. It says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried, comes back to that statement that Joseph Smith said, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And Joseph Smith was actually... Um, in, in his statements about baptism, was bringing in the very same things that Paul was doing and bringing in in the New Testament. It's Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 6. It says, Know ye not, this is Paul speaking now, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized unto Jesus Christ, were baptized unto his death. Therefore we are buried, or immersed, with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in a newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man, now keep this in mind, our old man who has not covenanted to be obedient is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So he's telling us that, that baptism is a burial. This is why no parts of the body, when we're baptized, we have witnesses there to make sure that no parts of the body come up above the water because the water is representing earth. It's representing a burial, not a washing. We're so familiar with water being used in washings that we, we make that connection automatically without any doctrinal backing or, or doctrinal concepts. But baptism represents a burial. That's what Joseph Smith said. That's what the Lord told Abraham. Uh, that's what Paul has said. 
that baptism is a burial. If we go on in DNC 76, it talks about, it, it brings the same concept up. Speaking of those in the kingdoms, they are they who received the testimony of Jesus and believed on his name and were baptized after the manner of his burial, being buried in the water in his name, and this according to the commandments which he has given. So baptism isn't meant to represent or be symbolic of a washing or a cleansing. It's symbolic of burial. That's the symbol of immersion. That's why it has to be by immersion, not by sprinkling, because it's not a cleansing. It's a burial. And in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 128, verse 13, we read, Consequently, the baptismal font was instituted as a similitude of the grave and was commanded to be in a place underneath where the living are wont to assemble to show forth the living and the dead that all things may have their likeness and that they may accord one with another. So the baptismal font is to be below the below where the living are wont to assemble, where the living normally walk, because it is to represent a burial. It's to represent a grave. It's a symbol of the grave. And that's why it needs to be underneath there. So baptism is not a washing. Uh, it's not a cleansing, it's a burial and represents a burial. Well, obedience, we, we've heard, Elder McConkie made famous the statement, obedience is the first law of heaven, but it's also the first law of the gospel. And when I say the gospel, we know that there's two churches. There's the all y'all come church, we call her, the church down on the corner, the, the ward that we go to. Um, and when we become a member of the church, the first thing we enter in, the first ordinance that we participate in uh, as in becoming a member, that initiatory ordinance is baptism. And Elder McConkie said it's the first law of heaven. We see that also, and this concept even within the temple and within, and within the church. Can The question everyone has to ask, can we be disobedient before we covenant to be obedient? Can we be disobedient to gospel law if we have not covenanted to be obedient to gospel law? Now, of course, you can say, well, we, we, will be, we can be judged based on the knowledge we have, and we can only be judged to the extent of what we know and understand of the law. But that's why Mormon brings it up, that, that children cannot sin, neither can those that do not have the law. In 2 Nephi chapter 9, uh, we read, Jacob writes, Wherefore he is given a law, and where there is no law given, there is no punishment. Where there is no punishment, there is no condemnation. And where there is no condemnation, the mercy of the Holy One of Israel have claim upon them. So where there is law, there can't. Where there is no law, there cannot be any punishment. And the holy, and the mercies of the Holy One have claim upon them because of the atonement, for they de are delivered by the power of Him. For the atonement satisfied the demands of justice. Upon all, upon all those who have not the law given to them, that they are delivered. Now that's child and adult. Doesn't matter. But woe unto him that has all the law, has the law given, yea, that has all the law, all the commandments of God like unto us, that transgresseth them. The real sinners are those who know and understand the law. I've often said that only those that can sin and sin well are those who know and understand the gospel are really members of the church, those who have that law, those who have the scriptures, and those who don't have the scriptures are not held accountable to that gospel law. Before we can fully participate as a member of the church, the all y'all come church, or a patron of the temple, one must first enter into a covenant of obedience. Hence that obedience is the first law of heaven and the first law of the church. In Exodus 19, he first puts them under a covenant of obedience. And in verse 19, verses 5 through 8, he says, Now if you will obey my voice, Moses went up to the mount, and, Mo and the Lord tells Moses to go down and talk to the people. He says, If you will uh, obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces and all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together. They all stood up and said, Yes. 
Altogether, they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So they stand up. It's called the acclamation anciently, the acclamation of obedience, where the, the covenant of obedience is presented to them with the promise of what's going to be done for them, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And they all stand up together and the people, it says, answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we do, we'll do. That's that acclamation of obedience. We see the same thing in the Book of Mormon in Mosiah 5 after King Benjamin's address. Um, in chapter 5, verses um, actually 5 through 7, uh, it says, And they all cried with one voice, saying, uh, We are willing to enter into a covenant with our God to do his will and to be obedient to his commandments and all things that he shall command us all the remainder of our days that we may not bring upon ourselves a never-ending torment, as has been spoken by the angel, that we may not drink out of the cup of the wrath of God. And now because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ. So that covenant of obedience precedes their activity in, in the gospel, just as it does with us in our baptism, as well as in our, in our temporal, temple worship. Well, bapti baptism is a sign, ordinance, and a covenant of obedience. Uh, in the Prophet Joseph Smith said, Upon the same principle do I contend that baptism is a sign ordained of God for the believer in Christ to take upon himself in order to enter the kingdom of God. Then he quotes the New Testament, For except ye be born of water and of the Spirit, ye cannot enter into the kingdom of God, said the Savior. It is a sign and a commandment which God has set for man to enter his kingdom. Baptism is a sign to God and angels and to heaven that we will do the will of God. There's no other way beneath the heavens whereby God has ordained for man to come to him. So Joseph Smith is explaining exactly what the, exactly what the scriptures do, that baptism is a sign to God and to angels, the witnesses in heaven, that we are entering in a, into a covenant of obedience. As, as Paul was saying there in chapter 6 of Romans, where the old person is laying down in that in the baptismal grave, they are laying down the old person that has not covenanted to be obedient, and coming out a new person that has covenanted to be obedient. And that's what Joseph Smith is explaining here. It's a sign to God and angels that we will do the will of God. Well, going to Second Nephi thirty one now, this is our purpose for being here. Uh, the question is asked, and now I would ask of you, my beloved brethren, wherein uh, the Lamb of God did fulfill all righteousness in being baptized by water. In other words, how did, God, how did Christ fulfill all righteousness when he was baptized by water? Which is a, which is, it's a, it's a very important question that Nephi is asking, uh, which is connected to us. Now, many will say, well, he really didn't have any sin, so he didn't need to be baptized. That's a wrong concept. He's not being washed. The baptism of Christ was not a washing any more than our baptism uh, was a washing. There's a whole other reason, and the scriptures explain that. Know ye not that he was holy, but notwithstanding he being holy, he showed unto the children of men that according to the flesh he humbleth himself before the Father, and witnesseth unto the Father that he would be obedient unto him in keeping his commandments. So it's what verse 7 is seven, saying, that Christ baptized as a witness of a covenant of obedience. Verse 9, and again, it showeth unto the children of men for us the straightness of the path and the narrowness of the gate by which they should enter, he having set the example before them. And he said unto the children of men, Follow thou me. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, can we follow Jesus, save we shall be willing to keep the commandments of the Father? explaining what that purpose of baptism is. Continuing on in 2 Nephi 31 and verse 13, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, I know that if ye shall follow the Son with full purpose of our heart, acting no hypocrisy and no deception before God, but with real intent, repenting of your sins, witnessing unto the Father that you are willing to take upon you the name of Christ by baptism. You remember, taking upon you the name of Christ, having a determination to serve him, uh, to the end, by baptism, yea, by following your Lord and your Savior down into the water, according to his word, behold, then shall you receive the Holy Ghost, yea, then cometh a baptism of fire in the Holy Ghost. So 
baptism, taking upon ourselves the name of Christ. And that baptism by water is a precursor and a prerequisite to receive the Holy Ghost and the baptism of fire and the baptism of the Spirit. In 2 Nephi 31 verse uh, 14, it says, But behold, my beloved brethren, thus came the voice of the Son unto me, saying, After you have repented of your sins, you're beginning that process of character change, and then witness unto the Father that you are willing to keep my commandments by the baptism of water. It's not a cleansing. It's a covenant of obedience. In Mosiah 18, when Alma is about to baptize Helam, we see the same thing in, in a couple of verses there. In verse 10 of Mosiah 18, it says, Now I say unto you, if this be the desire of your hearts, what have you against being baptized in the name of the Lord as a witness before him that you have entered into a covenant with him, that you will serve him and keep his commandments? in order that he may pour out his spirit more abundantly upon you. Again, so he's telling us Alma is explaining to Helam that baptism is a witness and a covenant that you will keep his commandments. He continues on when he actually baptizes Helam, he says, and when he had said these words, the spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he said, Helam, I baptize thee, having authority from the Almighty God as a testimony, that you have entered into a covenant to serve him until you are as dead as to the mortal body. In order that, and here's the blessing for that baptism, that the Spirit of the Lord may be poured out upon you, and may he grant unto you eternal life through the redemption of Christ, who's been prepared from the foundation of the world. So Alma is re reinforcing that baptism is a covenant of obedience. In Mosiah 21, we see, we read there in verse 35, they were desirous to be baptized as a, as a witness and testimony that they were willing to serve God with all of their hearts. In Alma 7, we see almost the same thing. Yea, I say unto you, uh, this is verse 15, I say unto you, come and fear not and lay aside every sin, which easy, easily doth beset you, which doth bind you down to destructions. Yea, come and go forth, and show unto your God that you are willing to repent of your sins and enter into a covenant with him to keep his commandments and witness it unto him this day by going into the waters of baptism. Again, even Alma is explaining, as we have read through all of these verses, that baptism is not a cleansing. It's a covenant of obedience that leads, that can lead to a cleansing, but it is not a cleansing. It's a burial of the old person. And you're, in your baptism, you are witnessing unto the Father that you have laid down the old person and you're coming forth a new person that is entering into a covenant to keep his commandments. In Moroni 6, we read, And none were received unto baptism, save they took upon them the name of Christ, which is having a determination to serve him to the end. That's the baptism. Now back to DNC. 20 verse 37. And again, by way of commandment to the church concerning the manner of baptism, all those who humble themselves before God, desire to be baptized, come forth with broken hearts and a contrite spirit, and then witness before the church that they have truly repented of all their sins and willing to take upon them the name of Christ, having a determination to serve him to the end. So all of our, our scriptures, the New Testament, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants are all explaining that baptism is a covenant of obedience. It's a sign, ordinance, and a covenant of obedience. It's not a cleansing. It's not a washing. And I know tradition is stronger than doctrine. Tradition becomes more sure than Scripture itself. And this is why I've said there's been a lot of primary presidents upset at me because they've taught this uh, to their children. Even bishops have done the same thing. Um, and I've had them both uh, a little bit upset with me because of these things that I've presented. Well, Moroni 6, when we talk about the gift of the Holy Ghost, in Moroni 6, verse 4, it says, And after they have been received unto baptism, they were wrought upon and cleansed by the power of the Holy Ghost. And then they were numbered among the people of the Church of Christ. Their names were taken. This is happening today. This is the same thing that goes today. That they might be remembered and nourished by the good word of God to keep them in the right way and keep them continually um, watchful unto prayer, relying alone, and that's key, relying alone upon the merits of Christ, who is the author and finisher of their faith. 
but after they had been received in the baptism, can they get the gift of the Holy Ghost? And they're cleansed not by the baptism. But the gift of the Holy Ghost can only come after a person enters into a covenant of obedience, and the cleansing comes by the power of the Holy Ghost. We see the same thing in 2 Nephi 31, going back to our chapter. Wherefore, do the things which I have told you I have seen that your Lord and your Redeemer should do. For for this cause they have been shown unto me that they might that ye might know the gate by which you should enter. By the gate which you should enter is repentance and baptism by, by water, and then cometh the remission of your sins by fire and the Holy Ghost. It's The baptism is a prerequisite to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, Joseph Smith taught about baptism and its connection to the Holy Ghost. He says, baptism is a holy ordinance preparatory to the reception of the Holy Ghost. You're cleansed by the Holy Ghost. You're cleansed by the power of the Holy Ghost. But bapt baptism is preparatory to the reception. A covenant of obedience is preparatory to receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. It is the channel and the key by which the Holy Ghost will be administered. There are two comforters spoken of. One is the Holy Ghost, the same as given on the day of Pentecost, and that all saints receive after faith after faith, repentance, and baptism. He continues, You might as well baptize a bag of sand as a man, if not done in view of the remission of sins and the getting of the Holy Ghost. Baptism by water is but half a baptism and is good for nothing without the other half, and that is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. A covenant of obedience is required before you can get the gift of the Holy Ghost, and it's the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's the power of, of the Holy Ghost that you receive a remission, that a person receives a remission of their sins. There's a do-over concept that I like to think of, and it's the do-over of night. At night, in the night time, when you go to sleep, it's a magic time machine. It gets you immediately dinner to breakfast. But the most important thing is you can't sin while you're sleeping. There is no sin. So every day is a new day because no one has yet sinned tomorrow. So that's a night is almost a reset button. And that's when we come down to the sacrament. It is a reset button. It's not what we have done. It's who we become. Repentance is the process of changing character. Baptism is the gate of change, a covenant and witness to God that we want to take upon ourselves the name of Christ in order to change, as it says in Romans 6. The sacrament is an opportunity to re-covenant and re-witness to God that we want to change to those with a broken heart and a contrite spirit and seeking to change. The, sac the sacrament is not a cleansing, but can be a reset button for a new day and a new week. We are cleansed from sin when we have no more disposition to do evil. But repentance requires a covenant, a covenant to want to change. That's the process of repentance. As it says in DNC 58, Behold, he who is repented of his sins, the same is forgiven. Repenting means you have changed. You are not. You you no longer want to do that. The same is forgiven, and I, the Lord, uh, remember them no more. And in eighty two, section eighty two, verse seven, he says, "But go your ways and sin no more. But unto the soul who sinneth shall the former sins return," saith the Lord your God. So we need to be changing character, and that sacrament is a reset button. So the renewal of the covenant of baptism is what we call the sacrament. If you look at the sacrament prayer and Mosiah 18, what Alma is telling Helaman, we read in verse uh, 77 of section 20, O God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls. Now, we often say, well, it's a blessing on the bread, but it's really a blessing on the souls that they will, that they will sanctify that bread to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them in the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he has given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. The prayer is really about the people partaking of the sacrament. But there's three key things there that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy son, uh, which we have read in scripture, is having a determination to serve him to the end. 
um, and to keep his commandments, which he has given them, that they may always have his spirit to be with them. It doesn't say anything about being forgiven. In the sacrament prayers that many people think that by partaking of the sacrament that your sins are forgiven, it says nothing about forgiveness. It talks about taking upon the name of the Son uh, or the name of Christ, which is having a determination to serve him to the end, to keep his commandments, which he's given them, so that his spirit can be with you. And this is what we see in Mosiah 18. If you want, if you want these blessings, in verse, as it begins in verse 10, if you want these blessings, then you're baptized in the name of the Lord as a witness before him, that you have entered into a covenant with him, that you will serve him and keep his commandments in order that he may pour out his spirit more abundantly upon you. So Alma is talking about the covenant of baptism and the sacrament is talking about the renewal of that covenant. The sacrament becomes a reset button each week. It's a reset button if we want to change. Now we often talk about partaking of the sacrament unworthily. The sacrament is for those who want to change. When the scriptures talk about partaking of the sacrament unworthily, it doesn't mean that you've committed a sin and you shouldn't partake of the sacrament. To partake of the sacrament worthily means that you recognize you've committed sin and you want to change. You want to make a change. The person who partakes of the sacrament unworthily is the person who does not want to change. If you partake of the sacrament and you do not want to change, you do not want to keep your covenants, if you do not want to be obedient to God, that's partaking of the sacrament unworthily. It's not the other way around. We sometimes want to punish people for the sins they've committed. For those who have remorse, for those who feel sorrowful, we sometimes want to punish them by not letting them partake of the sacrament. But the person who needs to partake of the sacrament is the one who has recognized that sin, has remorse for that sin, and wants to change from that sin, they're the people who need the sacrament and should be taking the sacrament more than anybody else. To partake of the sacrament unworthily means that you are not planning on changing your character. And we sometimes do ourselves a disservice by not understanding this. So the sacrament, in verse 77 as we read, eat in remembrance of the body of thy son, or the blood, if it be the water, witness unto thee. Here's that witness that's talked about baptism. Willing to take upon the name of thy son, to always remember him, to keep his commandments with the blessing that we may have his spirit to guide us in, in all of this, to guide us in our obedience. That's why the spirit is necessary. And Moroni 6, 3, none were received, and this is a repeat, none were received into baptism, save they took upon them the name of Christ, which is, i.e., having a determination to serve him to the end. It's often been taught that baptism, and consequently the partaking of the sacrament, cleanses one from sin. Baptism is a covenant and ordinance of obedience, just as the sacrament is. It's not, neither one of them, are a cleansing from sin. Just as baptism doesn't wash away sin, neither does partaking of the sacrament cleanse one from sin. Elder Bednar said, The ordinance of the sacrament is a holy and repeated invitation to repent, change your character sincerely, and, and to be renewed spiritually. The act of the partaking of the sacrament in and of itself does not remit sin. Sin cannot be remitted except through character change. God will not cleanse a person, the person has to, through his agency, decide to make that change. How much easier would it be to speak at your children's baptism or your grandchildren's baptism um, about baptism and explain that this ordinance is a covenant of obedience, that they are entering into a covenant of obedience rather than trying to imply that the child had sinned and needed cleansed in this water? how much easier it would be to teach about the concept of burying the old person and now you're coming out and you're coming out a new person that has entered into a covenant to be obedient with God. And we don't hear that. We don't teach that. Well, remember, as I mentioned as I began this, that it used to be said when a child was baptized, and I remember it well, even some of the bishops did it with my own kids. They'd bring the 
child up in front of the congregation and say, we'd like you to accept the newest member and the cleanest member of the ward. But in reality, uh, because that child could not sin until that baptism is what uh, that leader is saying in reality, is we'd like you to accept the newest sinner of the ward. Not the cleanest. He was cleaner the day before. They were cleaner the day before they got baptized than the day that they were, than the, than the day after they were baptized. Well, again, Joseph Smith says, baptism is a sign to God and angels and to heaven that we will do the will of God. And that is a covenant of obedience. The first law of heaven, the first covenant we make in the church, the first covenant we make in the temple. And it's the first ordinance in which we participate. But it's just, it seems like this, this concept, this ordinance, this teaching does need to be disseminated uh, as the scriptures dictate. Uh, section 68 of the Doctrine and Covenants says, parents who have children in Zion and teach them not to understand, the sin's going to be up on the heads of the parents. So the implication is, is teach them to understand, which implies that parents understand. And so... Um, you don't have to go through, you can go through these scriptures, you can go through many of these scriptures, uh, especially those in the Book of Mormon, and there's plenty of them in the Book of Mormon that talk about baptism. And you can teach your children that baptism is a covenant of obedience. By being baptized, you're entering into that covenant of obedience. Um, and then you can bring the sacrament right into that. They've probably been partaking of the sacrament long before they were baptized. And once they're baptized, then that sacrament should take on a whole new concept because they're renewing that covenant of obedience. Not, they're not renewing a washing or a cleansing. They're renewing a covenant of obedience. And that's what we need to teach our kids, that baptism is a covenant of obedience. Even though we sing that song in primary and everyone is, everyone is going to teach the tradition of washing, uh, that baptism is a washing and a cleansing. Everyone's going to teach that. It's just, that's just... Not true. And I know that's going to make a lot of people mad. It's going to upset a lot of people, parents, primary <laughs> teachers, primary presidents. Uh, but that's the tradition. Um, but the scriptures are replete uh, with mul multiple references that baptism is a covenant of obedience. That's what we need to be teaching as our children are coming to that age where they can understand right and wrong. They are entering into a covenant of, to be obedient to, to God's commandments, keep his commandments. It, it is important. I mean, Nephi is bringing it up at the beginning of the record. Mosiah, Alma, uh, Mosiah 18 is talking about Alma. So we have in the middle of the record, the middle of the time period, we have Alma, Alma the elder, and Alma, and then in chapter 7 of Alma, we have it being brought up again, that baptism is a covenant of obedience, just like Nephi is bringing up. And then in Moroni, the last writer of the record, a thousand years later, He's bringing the same thing up. He's, he's putting in his father's letters, uh, bringing the same thing up. The baptism is a covenant of obedience. So it's important. And then we have it also in our Doctrine and Covenants. You can't participate in the gospel, in the church, and you can't participate in the endowment, in the temple, unless you first enter into a covenant of obedience.